Welcome to Gladwin Free Methodist Church. Here's a report from the team that recently traveled to Haiti for a week. Our, t- our Haiti team, I think, is ready to go. So we had a great time before service praying, and um, we pray each week before service in, in the side room here, and we had the team in there, and uh, I could have spent the whole morning doing that. It was awesome. God's doing some big things. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, so go ahead. Bonjour. We're going to start with one of the songs that we sang during our Bible studies, and then we're each going to take turns sharing the part that um, meant so much to each one of us. You know, we each kind of divided it up, and hopefully it'll touch your heart the way it did ours. This first song, you'll probably recognize the tune. Um, it sounds a lot like ancient words, that the words are different. But we're also going to sing it just in Creole. But the English actually means, On Golgotha, on a cross, Jesus blood flowed. He allowed them to crucify him so I could have life. With all my heart, I am singing, How great is God's love. I worship and I praise for Jesus' sacrifice for me. On Golgotha. On Golgotha. together at the church and um, put our totes together and um, we had Kay from Midland come in to help us weigh them and get them all bagged up, help us to get the stuff in there the best way we could. We want to really thank her for all of her help there. And then um, also um, Dorinda and her co-workers, they made bags to uh, put around the totes which made it much easier going through the airport and customs with those handles on those totes than, than we could. Next picture. And he, we had um, 12 totes and four extra suitcases, plus all of our own luggage that we all had to manage going through. So it was kind of a hairy time. Next picture. And this is um, getting them all loaded in the... I think this is... Oh, actually, this is when we unloaded them. Okay, next picture. Um, when we got there, I was kind of going through culture shock. Every place that um, was there had gates around it and walls around the houses and um, wire or broken bottles on top. And so it, it was really different than what we're used to. This is the gate in front of Hope House. This is Hope House. It's a really nice facility for the kids. Okay. Um, we had three um, trailers that are shaped in a U form that um, they housed us in. The ladies were in one and the men were in the other. And then over top of it, they have a roof that um, keeps the sun out. And in that U area, we all, um, that's where we had all of our wonderful meals. And they really were good. Um, this is one of the ladies. This is between the kitchen and one of the trailers. Um, it's a little walkway back there. And she was doing the laundry. They um, had some... I felt bad that um, they had all of our laundry to do by hand. And um, here are Sue and Trish and Lisa. They're doing Doug's laundry. <laughs> Next picture. Um, we got to play games with the kids during uh, when they were measuring and weighing them. Here's Terry um, coloring pictures with one of the kids. 
and we were playing outside. Um, we were playing like tag and dodgeball, but there was no rhyme or reason to them. They were just doing whatever. The balls were disappearing, and they were laying on the tarps, and it was really a great time. Yeah, here's some of the older kids in their uniforms getting ready to go to school. And I just wanted to say that one of the um, favorite times that I had was every night our team got together and we had a Bible study and we talked about the highlights of the day and what things spoke to us through the day and I looked forward to that every single night and I loved the team we were with. I know that the Lord had just chosen everybody. I just had such a great respect for all of the people and, and the time that I had to spend with them. Um, the picture here shows Terry. Um, Terry and Doug did some uh, minor repairs around Hope House. Here Terry was um, fixing a cupboard where the cupboard door wouldn't shut. I think they installed some magnets to keep the door shut, but several times throughout the week after that we heard Terry say, they're still not shutting the doors. <laughs> they're still not shutting the doors. I think they had been so used to the doors being open that they just didn't realize they could close them. Next picture, this is Doug. Doug and Terry also worked on some plumbing. Um, we weren't there to see it, but I think it must have been um, a, a, a picture of a thousand words. I think it would have been a little hilarious. But even um, more hilarious than that, you'll have to ask Terry and Doug about their excursion to get the parts to do the plumbing and the paint to paint the wall. I think that was as much of an adventure for them as trying to do the repairs. Um, this is the wall. Um, this wall is below Franza Mallory's house. It was uh, real faded, and the paint was chipping and peeling. And we had sent tools, or we packed tools in our totes to paint and scrape the wall. So we scraped, and then after we scraped, um, we each put a message to Hope House. Um, and signed their name to it and then uh, we took a picture in front of it and then um, later that day we put the first coat of paint on it uh, was fun painting we, we all kind of took turns we all um, had a job to do and it didn't take long at all to get that paint on warm though we had to wait till later in the afternoon when the shade was on that side of the compound so we could paint <laughs> Here's just a picture of several of us. Um, you can see in the picture at the top, the house is all faded out on Hope House. I think probably last spring or last fall, somebody painted the Hope side of it, but house was pretty faded out. So I was able to take some acrylic paints that they had there and kind of mix them and uh, make an orange that was a little darker to print paint house. And then there was already some golden yellow for the orange. So that worked out well. But I really enjoyed doing that and, and uh, afterwards it, it looked nice. It, it made you feel like we were there to help them out and they were so appreciative of what we did there. We worked um, a lot that week with Diane Lennox. Diane is the director of the sponsorship program and she is in charge of sponsoring approximately 300 kids. The 300 kids are um, the kids at the orphanage, the children of the staff that work at Hope House, and then the kids at Lebu School, and also the kids that are in secondary school. So it's quite a job because each one of these kids twice a year get weighed, they get their height measured, and they get their feet sized for shoes. This information is then sent to their sponsors. The kids also, at the same time, sit down and write a letter to their sponsor, color a picture for them, and then after the letters are written, there's a job to translate them into English. Most of the kids write in either Creole or French, so those letters have to be translated. Lori, Sue, and our um, translator that went with us most of the time, Tony, spent hours working on translating those letters but it was a labor of love and um, I have to tell you the picture on the it would be my 
my right and her left is um, of a little girl. And these little girls were so sweet when they came. And it was like when you got done measuring them, they just wanted to hang on to your hand. They didn't want to go back to class. They just wanted to stay there with us. And um, there were lots of hugs, lots and lots of hugs. And one of the highlights, um, I think the third time we were at the school and measured, we were able to hand out dresses to the little girls that one of the ladies had donated and made and sent to the, the kids. The little girls were just happy with whatever they got, but the older girls we found, um, when they saw the stack, oh, I want the pink one, oh, I want that one. They were, they had their favorite colors and, and what they were looking for, but it was, um, it was really a blessing. And one thing I really, really want you to understand about this sponsorship program, a lot of times when we sponsor kids and we send the money, part of that money is used for administrative um, fees and, and working with the program. The program through HVAP to sponsor kids is 100% volunteer facilitated. No one gets paid. Diane gives her time. They use mission teams like ours to help with that work so there are no fees, no overhead fees. When you pay $36 a month, your child and their family get that entire $36. When the kids get to secondary school, it's about, I think, $44 a month when they get to secondary school. It costs a little more to send them to secondary school because HVAP doesn't have that school. It's, they have to send them elsewhere. But that money goes for their school uniforms. It goes for sh uh, shoes, socks, whatever the kids need. And then um, when they get their letters all wrote and uh, get their weights and measures all done, the, a lot of the kids were given a little goodie bag. Some of those goodie bags included extra gifts that the sponsors had sent. They also included two bags, one pound each, of beans. And our team sat many hours in bagged beans. Um, it was uh, a, a lot of different times. Um, at night, a lot of times we would sit in bagged beans and talk and, and work together. The guys carried them from the storeroom over to us and we sat and bagged them and counted them, but the look on the kids' faces when you handed them those beans, because I don't know how many meals that would make, it probably would depend on the size of their family, but they were just so thankful for every little thing that we did. All the Haitian people, um, they may not have very much, but they're happy where they are. And I think one thing I took away is I need to be happy where I'm at with what I have and God has given me so much when we go to Haiti we do a lot of um, different types of service projects and I get to share with you about the peanut butter 500 the peanut butter 500 300 300 we start out at you know, we head out and we um, pick up bread on our way fresh bread and we um, go to the schools we start out in a little room that they call probably their clinic and um, we form a little assembly line. We um, all get together and make these sandwiches. There's usually two or three. There was nine of us, eight of us in there because Lori was teaching. To keep the flow going, It's you don't have much time to do this, this portion of it. Um, so somebody will hand off the bread. Two more people will cut the bread and slice it. Two or three people will spread the peanut butter onto the bread, and then the other people will stack it into onto a a tray. As those trays fill up, we will split up in teams of two and then we go into um, the classrooms in teams of two and um, pass them out to the, to the students. The students were very um, happy to get sandwiches. We, um, apparently we, have, we were the first team to be in Haiti passing out um, Mamba sandwiches since before the hurricane? Before the hurricane. It was... Um, it was good for them. They were very excited to get sandwiches. And after we had done this and passed out um, sandwiches to all of the students, they had all requested seconds. So we were very happy to give them all seconds, except for the younger ones, we decided to um, give them a half a sandwich. These sandwiches, if you can see them, they're pretty big. They're probably, I'm guessing, maybe a 
three or four by maybe two or I don't know, two or three. They're pretty good sized sandwiches anyway. So um, after we passed them out to all the students in the school, we got to venture off into the community. Um, when you head out into the community, you'll see a few people scattered. But as you go out, the numbers just seem to multiply. Um, I went down one little road and there was just a little boy and a woman. Before I turned back, my tray was, was gone. Um, and if you've seen this tray that I started out with, it was gone before I turned back to join the team. So the team replenished my tray and we continued on. The goal was to continue down the community and make it into the orphanage. So we continued down the road and um, continued passing out these sandwiches. I'm sorry, this is, this is a very big deal to some of these people. So we head to the, com the community and down the road, that, um, and we can see the gate to the orphanage. We had to pass by people and tell them we would come back because so we wanted to get to this gate. And as we knock on the gate, nobody opens. We said they were closed. But not long after, after, as we started to turn around, people, all of a sudden we see hands coming over this gate. And then another hand and another hand. So we were able to pass sandwiches over the gate to these children. We don't know how they got to the top of this gate to reach these sandwiches. And then we saw the little heads poking over. So we passed their sandwiches above the gate. When my tray was empty, I started to back off and turn around, and I looked at the person next to me. They were handing up their last couple. And then as I turned around and I looked, everybody else's trays were empty as well. So as we turned around to walk away, we had to walk by those people that we had told we would come back, and we had to walk by them with nothing. My heart was broken. I went from the joy of giving those children sandwiches to sadness in a matter of three or four steps, maybe six or seven. I cannot express what that felt like to you, but I spent a lot of time in prayer that day. But <laughs> we got to another peanut butter flat 300 a couple of days later, and on that day, we decided we would cut almost all of those sandwiches in half. <laughs> So we made it back through the community. We made it into this school, which was um, a school we had never been into. And um, this school was very interesting. The children, there was probably over 50 children there. They were very happy to get sandwiches and also wanted seconds. Um, the school was, oh boy, they had dirt floors and um, brick walls, as you can see. Just um, tin roof that was just held up by the wood poles. They just had nothing in there to learn from, yet they were learning and studying. We were quite impressed with the fact that they were using what they had to have school. And this, the students were happy and, and learning and very thankful for the food that we gave them. And um, they didn't want us to leave. Some of them followed us out. But we did, um, we stayed for a moment and interrupted class long enough and then uh, we said our goodbyes and we made our way back over to the orphanage and we were able to get in that day. So then from there we went to the orphanage and this is the orphanage we made it in and we were able to, these kids were very shy it seemed. They would, um, some of them would run halfway and then stop and then walk over to us a little shyer and then others would stop halfway and we would we would go and meet them, but um, they all took a sandwich from us and, um, and began eating it. And then we had a few left, and we found out there was another class that wasn't allowed to leave their classroom, so we left a few extras there. But I have to say that this ending of this day warms my heart <laughs> because um, we were able to make it through the community that day and not have to tell anybody no. And... Um, we got into the orphanage and into the schools and, and reminds me of how thankful that we should be. We eat, most of us get to eat three meals a day and some of them don't get to eat daily. And I can remember, <laughs> I just have to say that I complain about burned toast and I should be ashamed. And I am. And I was very, um, 
reminded while I was there of what I have to be thankful for. And God continues to remind me as I'm home that um, he has truly blessed me. And um, I'm thankful that I got to go there and, and experience the good and even the bad, sad feelings that I had to go through to be reminded of what God has done for me. So I'm glad to give this microphone up. <laughs> Okay, right now I'm not here as myself. I'm here for Lori, who obviously couldn't be with us. She's in California, but she sent a letter with what she wanted said, and so I'm going to uh, share that. She had the chance, in her background, she was a French teacher, and so she had the opportunity, because all these lessons that are given to the children there are done in French, to go in and speak with them and do a lesson with them. And um, so we wanted to share about that. But first I want to tell you just a little bit about the school that you've been seeing pictures of, this Labu school here. Um, the school has children from preschool through fifth grade in the mornings, and then sixth graders come in in the afternoons. Many students are from Cité Soleil, which is the biggest slum in all of uh, the Western Hemisphere. Now, when Mallory uh, Neptune, who started this Haiti Foundation Against Poverty, began working in Haiti, she had a chance to ask some of the gang leaders who were really who were controlling Cité Soleil, um, the slum area there. Um, she she asked them what it was that they thought they really, really needed, and they said an education for their children so that they'd be able to get out of there. Well, Cité Soleil is, is a few miles, some distance from Lebu. Lebu is just a small Euro, uh, rural area that you saw here. But um, many, many students walk daily from Cité Soleil to attend this school and then go back. <clears throat> the areas you know, that they're coming from is totally impoverished. Uh, many have no food at all during the day besides what they get at school. And all, all of them are only able to attend school because of the sponsorships, which you saw about the sponsorships. And they're so grateful for the opportunity to attend. So here's Lori's letter. She said, Bonjour, c'est moi, ac moi. So good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is with great joy that I share with you some of my experiences in Haiti. God is so wonderfully good. Not only did he provide safety and strength for the journey, but he empowered our team to bring love and compassion to the people we spent our days with. It is truly a humbling experience to be amongst people who live such simple lives without the many material things we take for granted and yet radiate such peace and joy in the Lord. I was privileged to return to Lebu School to teach the students and help with translation work as they wrote letters to their sponsors. As well, I was blessed to be able to bring 30 children books in French to the school to provide storybooks for the children to read in their language of education. These books were donated uh, in memory of my granddaughter, Carmen Faith, each book having a book plate with her name and picture inside, and it brought me great joy to deliver them. When I arrived at the school, I discovered that the principal, many of the teachers, and some of the students remembered me. I was so surprised and thrilled to know that the lessons from our last visit had made an impact. With Sue as my assistant, I began teaching in the classroom with the youngest children, the preschoolers. I showed them one of the books I had brought and sang a song, Petit Poisson, which they enjoyed. And Sue joined in the fun. We moved through the grades from one through five, sharing the book and the song with the younger students. As the grade levels increased, I included more lessons about life in the U.S. and the interesting thing that one can do in Southern California, skiing and surfing, skiing and surfing all in one day. We showed them pictures and maps of the U.S. and Haiti with interesting facts about each country. To close each lesson, I shared with them that students in the U.S. and around the world are much the same. They try to learn and work hard at their studies, respect their teachers, and do their best. And most importantly, I shared with them that it doesn't matter where we live or the color of our skin. Jesus loves all children and people. And as I began singing in French, Jésus aime tous les enfants, Jesus loves the little children. Sue and the teachers and students all sang along. It was truly glorious. Even now it brings me to tears as I write this, for I feel so blessed to have felt God so close in those moments. My heart and thoughts are so full of Haiti. I cannot thank you all enough for your support that allowed all of us the privilege of serving the Lord there. I encourage all of you to seek God and ask him if he would have you step out in faith to experience the life-changing joy of Haiti. God bless you all.
So now we're going to show um, Diane had recorded a song that um, at one point at the school they sang for us and we sang for them and she recorded part of it so we wanted to share that with you. <laughs> I'm going to talk about um, the road conditions and one, another service project that we do while we're there. Um, the roads uh, in uh, Haiti are, uh, uh, most of them are just real dirt, dirt roads that are pretty small and they can be as small as like even a lane or an alley like in our area. There's a lot of heavy, a lot of deep crevices and things like that and uh, a lot of winding around too <laughs> and they're very high most of the roads are very high going up and a lot more lower going down because it's a very mountainous area so and then there are other roads as you get further in the city that are very well paved and maintained sometimes there's police officers directing traffic and sometimes not and there we did see some traffic signals and a couple stop signs on the main road <laughs> that was it but uh, in my opinion uh, they pretty much ignore them <laughs> So at times there's a lot of cars coming every which way on the main highway and you're like oh okay and then you have a motor a motorcycle or a motorbike that goes to just fly in between us and then they and then you got people running across the street not knowing you know not really <laughs> maybe not I won't want to say pay attention but they're just in a hurry to get to take their chance, I guess, and get across. <laughs> so that was uh, I one one part that um, that caught my attention when I was there, and I seen it a few times. Was that I saw a motorbike with a gentleman on it, and he had this very long metal metal or piece of wood on it, going to wherever he was going. And I thought, wow, they really do carry everything they can on whatever they have for transportation. Um, some other transportations they have there is, besides the motorbikes and the vans and the cars, they have tap-taps. I love the tap-taps as far as they're just gorgeous to see because most of them are brightly colored with religious symbols and Bible verses or praises to Christ. And they're very colorful, and it's like a, it's like a metal type container, usually maybe a truck overhaul or something like that. And they have wooden benches in the back, and people sit on them. But um, they don't. They kind of. I also kind of got felt like they stop pretty much anywhere, and you don't always know when they're going to stop. <laughs> so you got to kind of really pay attention. So when you're going through traffic. There's a lot of um, horn honking. I'm not sure what all the symbols of the horn honking means, but it's usually one or two blows, I think, to say, I'm here, or I'm in a hurry, or I want to go by. I'm not real sure about that. <laughs> and then there's others. The bicycle, some of the bicyclers or the motorbike people, they do use hand signals occasionally to tell people where they're going. But there's a lot of horns. And there could be... Like a traffic jam there could last for maybe two or three hours. <laughs> so uh, you don't want to get in one of them. Uh, then you have people in them jam that is in that jam and they try to turn around. And there usually isn't much room to turn around. So they end up partially maybe on the sidewalk or the curb. So, and okay, now I'm going to talk about the bedding for the bed. One of the service projects we do is we deliver a bed to a family. And um, the way they earn the bed is that, and it's a full bed with bedding and everything, is that they go through, I believe, educational courses or programs, and they get so many points for doing this. And after 
whatever the amount of points to communicate, um, they accumulate. I don't even know really what, what that number would be or anything, but they earn a, a full bet set and betty, and it's bought in the local area and delivered to the family's home. The betting we went on uh, that, I went, that I had took part in was in, called, in a city called Damas 69. It was, it seemed to be a fairly well off maybe village in comparison to some of the other areas we've seen. And she had a, it was a single mother. It was a one and a half year old, I believe. And she, and, and she had a two room house with no electricity. So in order to put the, see, to put the bed together, we used a cell phone light to see how to get the legs and stuff on. And she was so happy that to get a bed that she wanted the poles. This is her right here. I wanted the poles for us on her new bed for a picture. And it's an awesome experience. It was kind of a little difficult getting to the the house um, because part of the road is gravel, a lot of gravel, or the pathway was gravel and some very, very big holes. And then there was a portion of the the walkway that had some really slippery rocks on it. So you had to be careful when you touched the rock area because you would slide. You might slide. So and then it turned, was a very twisty type of went around quite twisty type of walkway and we took the mattress all the way down there and set it up for him and then we all gathered around the bed and and her and had a word of prayer blessing her and the family and gave him the Lord for a while to have the bed and um, just it's, it's an awesome experience to go do that um, blesses my heart every time for that there's so much Honestly, that blessed my heart when I go there, when I went there. But my brightest point, I think, was when the picture of the kids, when we were all singing there together and clapping. Um, that was uh, really felt like you were part of their their group, you know. And so that was a great blessing. Okay, my part was the men's Bible study. And um, found out uh, it was going to be the first men's Bible study ever to be done by the group that goes to Hope House anyway. And all the times they've had, and all the groups that they've had, they've never had a men's Bible study. Well, we signed up to do four Bible studies, two women's and two men's, and no problem. And... Uh, we picked uh, Acts 16, 22 through 34. It's a story about Paul and Silas getting thrown into prison <clears throat> and uh, by the Romans. And the Roman jailer was mean to them, and they got beat and put in stocks. And, but lo and behold, Paul and Silas, with their faith, prayed and sang as they were in stocks in the dark and deep in this prison. And uh, about midnight, huge earthquake comes and uh, breaks, opens up all the prison doors and gets them out of their stocks. Well, the jailer was going to kill himself because if you let the prisoners escape, it was really bad for the jailer. But Paul and Silas, they saved them and they taught them the love of Jesus is what kept them going. And they converted him and his family to believe in Jesus Christ as being the Savior. So that was the story, and I thought, well, this is going to be good. We, we have 17 or 18 meetings, and the last four or five we practiced. Everybody had a part. There's nine of us, so we have nine parts. So the, the, the last meeting before we go, we find out one interesting thing. There's nine people, nine parts, but women aren't allowed to teach men. So now we had nine parts with two people and a mad scramble. So then it would come become a little more uh, challenging to us. But Doug and I pulled it off, and uh, I really uh, I think it was a wonderful experience to uh, pray and to learn together with the Haitian people. Our first one was our first one was done in. Um, at the Hope House itself with the people that work there, the workers, they have translators, they have uh, drivers. Um, at Hope House, they have armed guards. That's, uh, and so some of the guards were there. And, uh, but I think 
I was under the impression, he could be wrong, could be right, I don't know, that some of the people were made to go there. You know, Diane says, hey, you're going to be in a Bible study at such and such a time. And so I didn't know if, how it would be received. In fact, there's, there's one gentleman that was sitting on the wall. We did a little thing. He sat there like this the whole time. I didn't know if it was going in his head or if it was just something he had to do. But when we got all done with our story and asked if anybody needed us to pray for him, those guys stood up, a guy like this, and they all had a, a prayer request. And so everyone that was in there had a prayer request. And we took all the prayer requests down, wrote them down on a piece of paper, and then we all got together and we prayed in a group like this. Now this one here is the group of ten that we did, but we did the same thing. We took all the prayer requests down, and then we got together, and we prayed together. Uh, everybody's prayer, everybody prayed for everybody else. It was, it was a, a real lifting experience. I, th- I think we, at this one, when we had ten different men, uh, it, we prayed for about five minutes. Out loud, some in Haitian, some in English. About five minutes praying for everybody's problems that they had. And you know what the number one thing, the number one reason people wanted to be prayed for is they wanted a job so they could keep their families together. The families are broke up in Haiti because of poor, there's no money to feed them. All they want is an opportunity to be able to support their family. And I would say that not, about 90% of them, that's what they wanted to get, uh, be prayed for. Another thing we had to learn how to do was working with a translator. And fortunately, we had very good translators. And some, if they didn't quite understand, you could look at the expression on their face, and then you could change the wording a little bit so that they could do it. But working with the translators we had was, was very interesting, and that was a, a good experience. Um, when we got all done with all of the both Bible studies, or the men's Bible studies and the women's, some of the women's, they had food prepared for the for the men, and they had these great big containers, and they they gave them all this food uh, to take home with them. They probably fed their families for at least a day, and uh, then we had uh, we we purchased Bibles for every. Uh, person at the uh, Bible study. So they all had Haitian Bibles. They could read in the Haitian uh, language. And then we also give them bookmarks that we, that we made right here uh, yeah, to give, put in their Bibles. Um, the women were allowed to do, um, to sing. They, that's, that wasn't part of teaching, so we sang songs together, and the men all joined in. The songs that we did today, they knew by heart. They didn't even need the paper. They knew them, and they sang by heart. And it was, it was an awesome experience to be singing with these people in their language. Um, and this is, this is one other thing that they allowed us to do, and that's Lori right there. She gave her testimonial. And I heard Lori's testimonial at least five times, and it always brought tears to my eyes. And just thinking about it today, it kind of makes me choke up a little bit. But Lori's um, granddaughter, Carmen Faith, passed away in 24 hours, and she was five years old. So she had these grown men in tears. Because they they are used to they've lost people too because of earthquakes and the hurricanes and whatnot and they know what it was like to lose somebody and she had all these men with tears running right down their face and even though I heard it five times it's kind of hard for me to hold back so but uh, they did allow that to happen and I'm glad I'm grateful for that because it was very very uplifting how uh, she kept her faith the loss of her five five year old granddaughter and then the last thing. 
After we got done with uh, the ten person uh, Bible study, we did a bed delivery too. I just want to touch base a little bit on that because it's kind of a shock. We, got, we come outside and the truck had two beds on it. I don't remember we were supposed to do this. Next thing I know, I'm carrying a bed on top of my head down this street that was probably as wide as the, the aisle here and locked my hat off and it was gone, but we were going way too fast to stop and get my hat. And uh, I thought, well, that's gone. Pretty soon, this girl comes running out behind me. Here, here, take your hat back. I thought, well, that's pretty nice. And uh, and then the, then the guy stopped me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Because I was carrying it like this. And he said, no, 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 you got to carry it like this. Grab a hold of the mattress and carry it like that. I said, okay, I can, I'll do whatever you say. And little did I know why, because when we got to the corner... The, eye, the alleys were about as wide as between your uh, uh, pews here that we had to carry this bed down, and we had to make 90-degree turns. And I was fortunate. I had the mattress, and Doug had the box springs. It was a little harder for that to, to bend, but, <laughs> but we got it done anyway. And the very last thing somebody brought up before I wanted to talk a little bit about was shopping for the hardware. That was a, that was a real experience. Uh, we, we went to four different hardware stores to get what we needed. The first one was kind of like an, um, an American hardware store where you can go in and you can pick stuff off the shelves and put it in the cart, then you go and pay for it. For some reason, we had to go to a couple other stores. We couldn't get everything we needed at the one. The only difference is when you walked out the door, you better have your receipt in your hand because there was a, a man there with a a pistol grip shotgun and he's going through everything in your cart and making sure it matches your receipt so I guess nobody you know walks away with anything but the other uh, three hardware stores we went to were different in the fact that you couldn't take anything off the shelves everything was nailed down you wrote down the number of the item that you needed you took it to uh, the uh, person that went and uh, got it. You took your uh, receipt to uh, somebody to pay for it, and then they finally gave it to you. And when you go out the door, you go out past one guard who opens the first door, then you're kind of like in a cage and with your receipt. And he says, okay. And then they open the second door, and there's a guard out there. And all these guards are, are heavily armed. So... Um, that was a different experience, how, how they go about. It took us a long time to get our stuff because we had to go to four to five different things. But it was a good experience. I felt real confident and real safe in these hardware stores. And uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, The only time I felt unsafe is when our driver stopped on the right-hand side of the road and the hardware store was on the left-hand side of this road road and country says, you're motorcycles and you got to cross the road. And I said, oh, I've seen how other people cross the road and it's just kind of scary a little bit, but we made her. And uh, when we came back out, he had managed to get the car on the other side of the road so we didn't have to cross back. But it was a wonderful experience and I want to thank everybody in, in the church for supporting our mission. Uh, we had a great team. I, I'm, I'm privileged to be a part of it and I'm privileged to share the love of Jesus Christ with the people. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Gift of Hope um, ladies program and the ladies Bible study that we did. So I kind of had my talk prepared in a different way than the slides come, but this is the Gift of Hope. Um, it's, a, it's a ministry that they have for the ladies to teach them, a, them trades. Um, they do hospitality. They do sewing. They learn how to run a little store that they have there. Some of the ladies do crafts. And then there's also ladies that work on commerce. They also have, um, which means they kind of have their own little business or they're getting ready to set up their own little business. They had hired this man to do cutting of a lot of materials. And I, I don't really remember why that was, but um, so this was kind of upstairs in this building that they rent. So um, they, they, this is one of the shops where they're cutting materials. First, first slide here. Okay, this is the area upstairs where they were sewing. And th- there was, I don't know how many, you know, I'm guessing there was probably 
maybe a dozen people in all that were working upstairs. And this lady in the brown shirt right here in the end, um, she started singing at her sewing machine. And she was just, and then all the other ladies were starting to sing along. And that was just kind of neat to see, you know, that they were happy at this work and at this trade that they're, that they're learning. Um, downstairs, this was, um, they have a, a gift shop and a little area that you can dine in. And, and you can see our serious shoppers there. Here are some of the ladies. Um, <clears throat> this was, I believe, this looks like the ladies that were at our Bible study. The, we did a Bible study there a few days. The last day we were there, we just shopped and toured Gift of Hope House. But this was a Bible study that we did, and there were four of the commerce ladies that were there um, that have their own little businesses. We were able to give them... And we left two others. We gave um, six um, of those little mats that we made to, the, to these ladies. Two of the ladies weren't able to be there. But then there were also a couple other ladies that were doing crafts, that were involved in the crafts area, and they also came to the Bible study. And as we were, as we were going um, around, the ladies asked for prayer at the end. You know, we always ask if anybody wants prayer. And each of the ladies um, asked for prayer. And... You know, their hearts were just, um, you could tell that they, they really had deep, deep needs and concerns on their hearts. A lot of them were for their families. Some of them were raising five or six children. Um, the one lady, she, her little son, um, Jervons, is one that and you may, some of you, if you kept in touch at all with some of the, the blogs from Haiti Foundation, there was a little this little boy Jervons had a very serious eye problem, and they were able to bring him to Michigan for eye surgery. He's still here. He's had the surgery, but he hasn't yet received his sight. So she's praying um, for Jervons to receive his sight, um, and of course she. She misses him. He's been gone a long time. Um, but each of the ladies shared their prayer concerns, you know, and, and it was a real privilege to pray for them, for them and with them. Um, okay, what's the next slide? Okay, this is the other Bible study, the first women's Bible study that we did. And this was at Nurse Marilyn's house. She's an aunt of Franz Neptune, one of the founders of the ministry. And she has these ladies in her house um, for various reasons. She has a little, it's a clinic actually where we had this, and this was also where we had the first, the second men's Bible study. The lady in the blue with the, with the yellow headdress, she had just received Christ that day. So, you know, this was like, you know, a big, thing to be able to do a Bible study with them. And again, they also, all of these uh, folks that participated in the Bible studies got a Creole Bible. Um, they pro we provided a meal for them here, um, which they served kind of out of the back, back room. And here we are doing some singing um, at one of the Bible studies. Um, you can see it, um, who were given out. But, uh, we also made bookmarks for them to help them remember the day and, and um, some verses on it um, about the about what um, the topic that we had gone through. Um, let's see what else we got here. And there's Lori giving out. That must be the Bibles. <laughs> She's giving out Bibles there. Um, and we did, we prayed with everyone at this Bible study as well. Anyone that wanted it, and Marilyn, she was like the first one to jump up and ask for prayer because she, she, does, she, she, she's like, I need a, a bigger clinic because she lives here. It's only two rooms, um, and she lives in it as well as she sees all her patients there. And even while we were at this Bible study, there was a lady in the back room that was receiving an IV fluids because she was dehydrated. The Gift of Hope ministry with the snack shop, we went there on the last day and had, had bought a snack. They served us. It was very good. Some great guacamole stuff. <laughs> it was really good. Um, and we also purchased, we made purchases of souvenirs, but we also brought back a lot of items, um, like four suitcases, four or five suitcases full to sell because they have a, a, a Gift of Hope store, boutique down in Midland. They also sell these items online and at various other outlets across the country. Uh, I don't know where they all are, but, um, you know, it's, it, it's just a blessing to be able to help these ladies. We were also able to give the commerce ladies with some of the money that we had raised. We were able to give them each $50.00. So that was, you know, for them to invest in their business. 
Um, so that's, you know, that's a pretty good little gift that they will use it, you know, that they will use everything that you give them. Um, but it, it was just a blessing to pray with the ladies to, to be part of their, um, to be part of their ministry. And another thing that some of the ladies got to do one morning um, was they went shopping for crafts because we had raised enough money that we could go and get craft supplies. And, and we bought, um, several ladies went and bought craft supplies and they just had a ball by, by buying these craft supplies that they then took to the Gift of Hope ministry. And we already, on the last day when we were in the store, we saw that some of the cording they had purchased had already been made into bracelets. And just really, um, some really lovely things that they make there. And each item that you purchase, whether you purchase it in Midland or whether you purchase it there at the store, has a little card attached to it and it tells you a little, it has like the woman's picture that made it and it tells you a little bit about her and maybe a prayer request that she has. So it's kind of a, a neat thing to be able to say, okay, I've, I purchased this and now I can pray for this person. I know we're really running late, so I'm going to try to keep this short. Um, before anything else, I want, I want to tell you, when we got to Haiti, it was such a... a bedlam of confusion and at the airport they kept saying who's your boss who's your boss and we all pointed at Sue because she really was our boss and so she got the title boss through the whole thing uh, and I'm so thankful that she put the time and the effort and the patience in with us we, we were in Atlanta coming home and the um, our, our planes were all messed up we were in bad weather and, and we're going through security Sue and I got through it first and I said okay we're going to run ahead try to see if we can just stop the plane and I I thought, you know, Sue's never going to keep up with me because nobody normally does. And, and off we went. And that was the last I saw of her. Um, I, I, a couple times I caught a glimpse of her way up ahead of me. I got on the escalator. I was behind this really large girl who wouldn't let me through, you know. And this Sue was just gone. And so she was there waiting for me. I thought she, she probably figured I was dead because I'd been left so far behind. Um, so thank you, Sue, from the team. We really appreciate it. Years ago, when I came back to the Lord, I told him I would not speak in public and I would not work with teenagers. Um, I, I shared that with a lot of people in our congregation before. Um, you go a couple years ahead and I'm working with a bunch of teenagers in a church, um, a, a, a group of adoptive and foster kids. And we had a 16-year-old girl show up one night to our group and talk to us about having been to Haiti for the first time. And we were like... I was so taken back by it, you know, and she, and she went to this place called Sisters of Charity and talked about her experience there. God laid it on my heart that night that someday I was going to go there, and I, as usual, I said, you know, God, I'll do anything, I'm not going there. Um, because I had all these kids, you know, I had all these adopted kids, and I'm thinking, I'll be like in my 60s before I can go, what good will I be then? And the next thing I know, when we're there, I'm standing looking at this wall, and way over on the far corner, there's this little green door. And it's got a rust spot in the door where people have been beating on it to get in. And so I pick up a rock, and I'm beating on the door, and part of our team is already there. And as I'm beating on the door, this woman opens it up, and we go down these stairs into a building and down a hall. And I walk into a room of, of babies. And there's like 50 babies in this room. And these nuns are taking care of them. Um, my wife already had a little girl picked up. And my wife's always trying to get me to take more kids. Um, I don't know what the deal is with that. But she's got this little baby girl. And I'm, I'm holding her. And, and she's so precious. And, and she just cuddles up with me. And, and I'm... I'm just soaking it in, you know. We, we come back a couple of days later, and again, I'm late. Um, and I run to the bed where the little girl, number 21, is the bed that she's in, and she's not there, and I freak out, you know. And so I look around for another baby to hold. And I find this little boy who's probably, he looks to me to be a couple months old, but he's probably much older than that. And he's a failure to thrive baby. I can see it the minute I look at him. And... Um, and I held him, and I held him, and I prayed for him, and then Diane, who was there with us, came and prayed with me. All the kids had little name tags on their ankles saying who they were. This little boy didn't have a name. He'd never been named. And, I, and as I looked at him, I thought to myself, I have been so fortunate to grow up in America. You know, I, 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 got, I get called a lot of names here. Um, <laughs> Some of them are good, you know. 
But you know, as I, as I looked at him and as, as, as Diane and I sat and prayed for him, and she, and she said one of the most beautiful things I ever heard. God, you know his name. And I thought about that. You know what, the, what him and I had in common? We both need Jesus. Um, probably by now he's with Jesus. I mean, he was, the nuns had told the folks not to even worry about picking him up because he probably wasn't going to live long. And as I held him and I could see him just struggling to be alive, I thought to myself, this world's not good enough for you. It is not good enough for you. Um, so we prayed for him and I held him. And he finally fell asleep and I put him back in his bed and then I went and got that little girl who who kept wiggling her toes because she wanted to play this little piggy went to market, you know. And um, the rest of the week, these words hung in my head. Let my heart be broken. Let the things that break your heart. And my heart needs to be broken by the things that I know break God's heart. It says that Jesus looked at the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And he told his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I thought when I was going to go to sisters that was going to change something there, and God sent me there to change me. Um, it was quite an experience. Mother Teresa, who started that place, said this once, God is painting a picture of his love for the world. We are the paint strokes. Thank you. Okay, I'm the last one, and I'll be quick for you. Um, but what I wanted to share was that what makes a really great mission trip, it, it doesn't end when you come back home. It continues on when you get home. There's ripples that come out from it and emerge into the future. First, there's the change that it makes in us, in our hearts, in our worldview, in the way we choose out to live our lives after this experience. I've heard many of us saying how superficial our lives here seem, and like we left what was real back in Haiti. I know I have a sense of how much unnecessary stuff is in my life and how I really want to simplify life here and, and live life at a more real, focused level than I have before. But there's a few concrete things coming out of this that uh, make a difference. The first um, is, uh, Lori talked about the books that she had brought down. She had delivered 30 books in honor of her granddaughter, but she's come back with a sense of mission that she wants to continue collecting children's books in French to keep sending down with teams so that um, they can add to the, the small amount of books that they have there for children to read. Also, um, after seeing all the sponsorship, um, we as a team decided that we wanted to be involved in that too, that we wanted to have a part in what was going on there. We, we picked little Woodson, and we wanted to have him. We had bought him a few items, and um, he hadn't been there when we were there. We were trying to connect, and then unfortunately, as so happens in these areas often, uh, family situation just kind of came undone. He ended up living with a aunt away from the area and wouldn't be uh, attending the school anymore. So um, after we had left, Diane had picked picked little, um, and I'm not quite sure how to say his name. I think it's Aude, something like that, and uh, picked him for us. And so we've got all his information, and we as a team will be sponsoring him. Um, those items there are ones that we had purchased for him, so there he is enjoying them. Uh, the little stuffed dinosaur, and, and he wasn't too sure about the book bag. But um, he's also the, the um, son of one of the uh, teachers who works at the school as well. And last but not least, there's Reynald. And I know you've heard us talk about Reynald before. Yeah, Reynald. It's um, the community that... Um, Haiti Foundation Against Poverty uh, kind of adopted um, after the hurricane and um, it was totally devastated it's down in an area that's a more agricultural area and um, there was only one house left in the area the animals were destroyed the crops were destroyed and Haiti, had, Haiti Foundation Against Poverty France had been down in that area trying to look for a community to kind of adopt and restore and um, 
some of the areas were just too big where he felt like they couldn't do much there. Some of the areas he felt like they had a, a sense of entitlement and he, he kind of was looking for somebody that was looking for someone to just work, come alongside them and work with them. And uh, he found this community of Reynolds, which has about 300 families in it. This is the type of homes that were uh, there before originally. And... Um, that was before the earthquake when there was nothing left. And these are the houses that have been built there now. And the p people have been painting them. They are nice, uh, solid houses with a concrete floor. Um, I wanted to read something off the uh, blog there that said, um, Franz came home with a building burden to build more houses. 42 houses isn't nearly enough when he had 42 more families following him around begging for his attention and pleading for a home. Even before the hurricane, houses in the area were largely built from mud, woven leaves, and pieces of metal. The beautifully painted homes with windows, doors, and a cement floor are like palace living. One woman curled up on her cement porch for a photo and posed as if she was sleeping on a pillow top, king-sized mattress. My house before the storm was made of mud and sticks in the ground. Now I have a cement floor. Only God could have done this for me. I thank him and pray for my sponsors every day. So we came back with another mission in mind um, to try and provide one of these homes that they are um, hoping and praying for and people getting on their list. The homes cost $4,000, and we had some money left from our trip that we said we're going to put all toward it, and then we decided that we would try and... Uh, uh, add to that amount and we would put it out to you as a possible thought that you might want to contribute to if you would like to even a dollar a week it doesn't matter how much it will all add up we can you can put it in your offering envelope and just mark it Haiti and we're going to see how quickly we can be able to build a house for uh, somebody there not only that but um the, the manufacturer of these homes has said that for every house that is purchased and paid for, he'll put in another one. So if we do one house, it's like doing two. So we get a big uh, thing there. Um, also, we had a little bit of money that you guys had prov generously provided for us left over when we got down. So we sent it ahead of us. Um, and some went for the other things that you've heard about for the commerce ladies and for the craft supplies. But some went to two of these ladies here. This is Alancia. And Alancia <clears throat> is 86, lives with her three grandchildren, as well as having taken in a neighbor who needed housing. Before the hurricane, she was a farmer and also raised chickens and goats. Her request was for life and health and for God to bless her with a house and food. Um, so she had this house and with a... 250 that went to her from us, she was able to completely uh, restore her garden, replant her garden, and um, we have her name, we have her information, it'll be on the back bulletin board, you can check on it so that you can keep praying for these people, and then we have Lena, she's also an older woman that was down there. She was asking for problems because she's got some, some kind of skin problem and problems with her legs. She was asking for prayer for that. Her uh, house was also destroyed, and when they interviewed her, she was saying what she needed was a house and food. Um, and she lives alone, but she's also taken in a neighbor who needed some housing, too. And um, so we were able to get her garden going as well. And finally, we'd like to continue our partnership with Haiti Foundation Against Poverty into the future, helping in any way we can. Several of the staff asked when we'd be back again, and we don't know the answer to that, but our hearts are there, and who knows what God has planned for the future. We want to thank every one of you for all that you did for sending us to Haiti, and our prayer is that what we've done and will continue to do will bring glory to God and continue to bless many for a long time. Well, we have a good guy. So, um, let's stand and um, let's pray. And there's a great fellowship time. We have a team here that can answer a lot of questions. And if we're late for Sunday school, we're late for Sunday school, right? We're, we're here enjoying God's presence today. So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for uh, meeting with us today. And uh, Lord, I thank you for this team. And we cannot begin really to, to grasp what, um, what they have experienced and, 
the things they have seen and been part of, but Lord, I know and I see in all of this that your church is working and being connected. And that it is powerful in the way your love goes forth. Father, I pray that you would help us as a church to be um, to continue to, to walk with the Haiti Foundation Against Poverty. Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts and that we would be able to, to help provide um, another home uh, for Ronald. And Lord, Lord, you just would, would bless in that way. Father, we thank you for your great love. Thank you for this time that we've had, and we thank you that we can celebrate, but also be mindful that you are calling us to respond to to a need in some way, and may you find us obedient. And we pray us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.